Welcome to a conversation with Ann and Joe Scheidler. I'm Eric Scheidler, Executive Director of the Pro-Life Action League. I'm here with Joe Scheidler, our National Director, Ann Scheidler, our Vice President. They are together the founders of the Pro-Life Action League, which was incorporated on June 1st, 1980. I was, I guess, uh, how old would I have been, 12? I was gonna turn, no, 13. I was gonna turn 14 later that year, so I was 13 years old. I had just graduated from Queen of All Saints grade school uh, when, when this part of the uh, adventure began. So welcome, Mom and Dad. Hi, Thanks. Eric. Thanks, Eric. Thanks, Eric. I remember your eighth grade graduation. <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay, you forget it. <laughs> Among other things. <laughs> yeah, and I, I have the privilege of having had a graduation that could be remembered as exactly. such. Exactly. Yeah. Um, several of my nieces and nephews have uh, have not been able to have graduations um, in the normal way. And some of them have been, you know, more creative and others have been more disappointing, but we've done our best, I guess, under the circumstances. Well, actually, we celebrated uh, two of the grandchildren's graduations yesterday, Lydia and Joe, and in both cases, their schools did a capital job of making it really special um, so that although they weren't marching down the aisle to pomp and circumstance, um, I, I think at, at uh, Riverside Brookfield, they had the pomp and circumstance music playing. Each kid went up and, and got a picture taken, you know, and, and the school had posted the pictures of all the graduates uh, in lawn signs around the, the building so you right. could go stand by your sign. And, oh, cool. and yeah. they, they won't forget what, what no. their graduation was like, no. that's for sure. <laughs> I don't think any one of any one of us will ever forget 2020. <laughs> no this year no. of of COVID uh, and lockdowns, and now not a have, good year, but not a forgettable year. Not a good year. <laughs> and then now we have riots, riots in the streets. Yeah. So, oh my goodness! City. A bit of everything. Mm. So, you know, I think uh, maybe that's a good place to start. Um, you know, as people who are involved in public protests, is is a central part of what we do. Um, it's particularly sad to see uh, a, important protests about serious social injustice turn into violence and mayhem, isn't it? it it's really tragic. It's so sad, you know. I, but oddly, <laughs> I have to be proud of the city of Evanston. Now, Evanston has always been one of our more difficult places when we are on our truth tours and stuff. But Evanston had a a very large, very peaceful demonstration over the weekend. It didn't turn violent, and God bless them, they were able to pull that off. Good, good for them. <laughs> I <laughs> thought Aurora would too. I was really, really horrified when things turned bad in Aurora, and I'd been down there. I went down on my bicycle after dinner to, to kind of check things out and took a little two-minute video of a relatively small, pro about 200 people were protesting and uh, Black Lives Matter signs and stuff, and you know, after the the shooting here, the, the horrible you know mass murder here last year that made you know international news. Yeah, I really yeah. thought Aurora was not going to turn violent. I was terribly disappointed to see it go that way. Yeah, it's very sad, isn't it? Well, I was shocked with Minneapolis. You know, I'm in St. Paul. Those are beautiful cities, quiet, calm, loving, uh, and uh, to imagine that everything started there, this this uh, rioting and all. Yeah, it's it's a it's a town it's a town that's kind of known for for being you know more progressive and you know and and, and being you know a a place where you know we don't we're not we don't associate Minnesota with uh, you know no, no. racial I mean, tension. Minnesota nice is the sort of motto of the right. place, but more. I mean ter terrible injustice there and a late response to it on the part of authorities and. Just Red like wildfire. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, our country has got some serious problems. Uh, abortion is not the only one. We have some serious social ills to be corrected here before we can be what America's meant to be. We've got a ways to go. You know, while we're on that subject, as a way of kind of moving into the story of the Pro Life Action League, um, Mom, you mentioned to me um, this morning that. Uh, this isn't the first time that riots have 
taken place in, in Chicago and uh, and there's a kind of connection to our family and to the pro-life cause there. Why don't you tell us a little bit about what happened in 1968 after the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr.? Well, Joe was working for the city of Chicago at the time and riots broke out all over the country, significant riots in Chicago. And um, he had been working late at the office downtown. Well, it was on the near north, actually, um, by uh, Ontario and the South Street, I believe, is where that office was. Um, working late, plotting where the um, violence and vandalism was breaking out all over the city. So the following morning, I uh, drove him down to work. And Eric, you were a year and a half old. Joey was about six months old. I had two, li li two, you know, two little kids in the back seat of the car. And I dropped him off and then headed back to um, the north side where we live, still live, um, by, by um, taking Division Street, which ran right through the Cabrini Green housing project where tons of violence had been going on all night. And I, w I wasn't really, although I'd been watching a little, but we didn't have 24 seven TV in those days. Right. So, you know, I wasn't really thinking clearly about what would be the best route home. And the National Guard had been called out and I come to this intersection and there are our soldiers with fixed bayonets and, you know, army vehicles it, uh, on the streets around there and they stopped me and, and asked where well, I'm here I am a white woman driving through this uh, very segregated all black terrible housing development that fomented trouble all the time and uh, you know where are you going well I, I'm just trying to get back to the expressway and uh, the guy says lock your car and keep going <laughs> but at home um, we happen to be um, uh, housing a young lady that was pregnant. Uh, Joe's cousin, Father Leo Pickett, was camp, campus minister at Purdue University. And when uh, young girls would come to him pregnant, they, you know, would, needed some place to go a lot of times because uh, pregnancy when you weren't married wasn't uh, accepted like it is now. And he would call on various friends of his to see if they could open their homes to these young ladies. And, and in this case, the girl's uh, uh, boyfriend was actually in Vietnam. He was fighting in Vietnam. And he had notified, when they notified him that she was pregnant, he had told them that he'd marry her if they insisted, but he didn't love her. I and mean, it was very heartbreaking for the poor oh, girl. Uh, he ultimately <laughs> was killed in Vietnam. Uh, but she went ahead and had her baby and she came and lived <clears> with <throat> us. And it was our sort of introduction, I guess, to the pro-life ministry several years, four years before Roe v. Wade mm -hmm. came down. Um, actually, five years, I guess, before yeah. Roe v. Wade oh, came wow. down. And for, um, for a few years after th this girl lived with us, um, her name was Mary Jane, mm -hmm. but you were just a kid learning to speak. And so you called her O.J. Nini. <laughs> she had a hard decision to make too because the yeah. parents of her you know spouse unmarried spouse, boyfriend yeah boyfriend wanted desperately to adopt the baby yeah they wanted the child they had lost their son and they wanted this baby and she had a battle to go yeah through. she opted to place this baby for adoption through catholic charities and wow. uh, we still have a couple of Christmas ornaments that she made for you and for Joe. Oh, the little, the I didn't realize that little, was, I remember those ornaments. I didn't realize yeah. that was her. Yeah, we hang them every year. Oh, They're silver cool. ornaments with a little Santa face yeah. and your name and Joe's name. Yeah. She sent us one for Peter when he was born, but that one broke. <laughs> so oh, no. we, still, we still have the other two. So you yeah. haven't had contact with her since like the 70s and 80s? No, um, we haven't. I, sure. I assume that she probably married and, you know, began a new life and she was just a, a lovely girl and we we enjoyed having her and she and I did some sewing together and I wonder if there's any way that this conversation might somehow lead to a reunion uh, mean, wouldn't that be wonderful that yeah. Really something yeah you know, in this yeah. day and age she may have she may have since then reconnected with that child because so many adoptive parents yeah. uh, or adoptive children have sought out their birth parents that could be yeah 
Wow. Just yeah. one, one of those adventures along the way. Yeah, yeah. Well, we should talk well, about- you know, at that point that where we would end up several years, you know, a few years later. No. <laughs> right. Yeah, that's so not a good, Little would you have guessed <laughs> that five years later, you'd, you'd be leaving the advertising business and, and uh, getting into full-time yeah. full life work. Let's talk a little bit about that, because um, I, I, I have a bit part to play in that story, too. It was October of 1972. Um, maybe uh, Matt or John, who are kind of helping monitor the tech side, maybe they can give us the exact date uh, uh, in 1972 when, uh, when we all went down to the Civic Center. Um, yeah. I wanted to tell a little bit of that story. Well, that was yeah. that was interesting. That yeah. was interesting. Yes. Yeah. Well, I I had heard uh, that Ann had heard that there was going to be a, a pro life gathering, and there was going to be a speaker, Henry Hyde, and so on. And yeah. I was all set to to listen to a, or watch a football game, Notre Dame, Saturday afternoon, beautiful October day. But uh, having taken a vow of obedience at marriage to my wife, I had to go. So. Uh, we took you two boys and we went down and... Uh, well, we took three boys. Th that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I keep forgetting how many uh, adventures <laughs> we taking four boys. But uh, we went to it and on the way to the talk, somebody handed me life and death. It was a pamphlet that showed abortion put out by Jack Wilkie's group down in Cincinnati. And it... Uh, the babies, there were babies in a basket. Um, we could probably a, grab from, a copy of from that. A, from a Canadian I'm hospital, sure. yeah, from a Canadian hospital. And uh, one of the babies, Eric, looked like your baby picture. Yeah. And it just hit me. These, these are great big babies. They've been aborted legally. Fortunately, that, that was Canada, but nevertheless, it just struck me well, how terrible abortion was to uh, kill babies and throw them in a garbage can. And of course, abortion and wasn't legal yet in, the, in legal. most of the well, United was States. 72. It wasn't legal in Illinois. So we hadn't really taken a, a particular interest, um, but th there was occasionally efforts in Springfield to get um, the, the abortion laws relaxed in Illinois, and Henry Hyde was, um, was active in preventing that. But Illinois at that point, was um, a pro-life state, really, if you had to you know, oh, yeah. analyze the leanings of the state. It was legal in New York and Colorado and Hawaii. Um, Michigan had legalized, but was in the, in the uh, action of, of over overturning that, you yeah. know, yeah. Um, prior to Roe v. Wade. That's worth, so. that's worth making a note of, you know. Um, so many people okay. now believe that legal abortion was just inevitable culture was going that way no was not at all it was actually rolling back yeah it was yeah states had seen oh. the especially new york became a dumping ground people were traveling all over the country the world to go to yeah. work for abortion and that was the center there. of abortion that. yeah and we, we learned about a uh ring of of abortion minded women down at the university of chicago who um, founded a group called the Janes that would arrange to send women to New York for abortions and then discovered that they could actually do this themselves. They thought it wasn't that difficult to do an abortion and they weren't doctors. Yeah. None so of they had this things. illegal abortion ring running out of, in Hyde Park. Remember the Religious Coalition for Abortion Rights? Yeah, the, yeah, the religious a bunch of ministers who arranged for abortion in New York. So that was uh, October 7th, 1972. October 7th was the day that we went down uh, to the Civic Center. Yeah. I don't remember it, uh, but I was only six. So yeah, yeah. I guess that's okay. Um, I had just turned six. We've got some, uh, some friends on the feed with us here from uh, days gone by. Uh, Brian Gibson says hi. Oh, hi, Brian. Astrid Bag Gutierrez, uh, Don Fitzpatrick. Uh, Don's on furlough from the Archdiocese of Chicago, but still came out for uh, the protests we did in the Waukegan uh, about 10 days ago of the new Planned Parenthood there. So it's great to have so many folks joining us uh, on, the, on the live feed. So after, after that uh, rally at the Civic Center back in, uh, in October of 72, 
let's fast forward to January 73. Um, January 23rd, the day after the Supreme Court ruling, the headlines are in the paper about what's just happened. Um, Dad, yeah. you were home sick with the flu that day. Yeah, I wasn't feeling well. Not COVID. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, just uh, feeling Would have been bad. a very early case. It was, um, yeah, I was working as an account executive for a public relations firm and had my own office and a skyscraper with a porch and everything. It was great. But uh, that day I was sick, so I didn't see uh, the paper. And besides, everything else was happening. I think uh, Lyndon Johnson, uh, Linda Johnson yeah, died. Lyndon Johnson died. The Vietnam War also. was um, closing off. And, that, and it was uh, almost back page story. And not yeah, the big thorough. headlines were the president, you know, the former yeah. president dying. Uh, and so, and so the way the papers uh, presented the, the abortion decision, Roe v. Wade, Dovey Bolton, was that it was, uh, it, there was a limit to it. It was like the first trimester, and but they didn't go into Dovey Bolton, which has the parameters, abortion at any time for a health reason. And health was so broad mm -hmm. that uh, it, you could have abortion right up till birth. That was what Roe v. Wade was. And, and I, I read both decisions, and I said, this is abortion on demand till the day of birth. Mm -hmm. And it's been that ever since. So I just, I got so obsessed with abortion. I read everything I could find on it. I found out who the leaders were, other pro-life groups around the country, um, the, the Wilkies putting, putting out the book on, uh, on abortion, and the pamphlets and flyers, and, and uh, others who are already active in abortion, Dr. Paul Marx, uh, Benedictine, had, been, had written a book on abortion. And so I, I got in touch with all these people immediately to see what they were doing. And um, I became obsessed with fighting abortion, and my job just didn't mean anything to me. <laughs> <laughs> and my and my boss sort of noticed that. So well, and I was pregnant with our daughter Kathy when that decision came down. I was four and a half months pregnant, and I was just incensed that our government didn't recognize my baby as having any value yeah. unless I was happy to have her. It just did not seem like America. To yeah. me, yeah. it no, shouldn't be. It, it shouldn't not. shouldn't happen. Yeah, that brings to mind, and I, I don't want to insult anybody who might be watching. Um, so with some some reluctance, I bring this up. But sometimes at pro life rallies, you see that sign. Um, there's different ways of phrasing it, but it's something along the lines of "Smile, your mom chose life." I don't like that sign because I don't think of my mom Ann Shidler as having chosen life. It's not as if abortion was on the table and you decided. Not to have. No, no. I mean, the no, assumption that never. everybody makes a choice about whether to go ahead and have a baby or not. <laughs> I mean, and I'd be happy if it said something like, "Smile, your mom was raised in such a way that abortion was never something she would have ever considered." That's yeah, yeah, closer to the truth. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I understand the sentiment that people are. You know, forever. another sign I don't care for, Eric, yeah. is the one that says, um, "A baby changes everything." That that's meant to be. A, a reference to the Blessed Mother saying yes to having, you know, giving birth to Jesus and all. But that's part of the reason people choose abortion. A baby does change everything. There's no getting away from that. No. When you um, have a baby, your life is not the same. And you have to accept that that's a reality. And it comes with hard times and good times and, you know, wonderful memories and sadnesses and, and things. Um, so I think it can be kind of a, a misleading. It's meant to be a good message, but yeah. I don't think it works. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's tough, though, because, you know, that's one of the struggles in any movement is uh, finding the right message, a message that's going to work and it's going to be effective yeah. know, across audiences. And that's something we really strive to do at the Pro-Life Action League. Every time we protest, every time we yeah. lobby, every time we hold a rally or do something uh, in social media, really trying to reach the public. Uh, in yeah. The yeah. And the individuals. I mean, we were at, at an abortion clinic on Friday morning. We thought we had a, a save um, young woman who, who came in, you know, with her boyfriend. They already had an eight month old. She was only 19, but she didn't want to do it. It was clear she was very confused and not, 
not sure. And, um, and she, she took the time to talk with us. She took the literature. Uh, I thought we but, did. Uh, but ultimately, I think it, it, that she probably did go ahead with it. Um, yeah. Well, I talked um, to the boyfriend. He took her in. And when he came out, I just, just tried to talk to him about the regrets and so on. And it turned out that he said he had tried to talk her out of it. So, but he'd already told me that already, it was none of my business. It was their no, choice, and so we were conflicted. trying to find the 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 right words to say. You know, you always have to just hope the Holy Spirit has given you something sensible to say that might make a difference. Um, maybe you don't know. Yeah, uh, so and she also know. had the information on the reversal. So if she changed her mind later, it's possible. Oh but you know, we're there anyway. And that's, that's what the pro life action league is all about being there, being there ourselves. We're out on the front lines and also, uh, being there for the activists. We have, uh, signage available to you. We have instructions on working with police on coordinating with the local churches on, uh, dealing with the media. That's the pro life action league from the very beginning has been there to empower people. And I'm going to talk in just a minute about the founding of the league. Uh, I want to say a uh, hi to a couple more folks out there. Um, we got Steve Peruka watching. Hey, Steve. Oh, Steve. Hey, Steve. Hi. Hi, Steve. We've well, got Steve, Shirley Butts. We've got a whole ton of grandchildren that are all the same age. <laughs> Steve's a great guy. Charlie <laughs> Butts is watching. Uh, I often speak with him at uh, oh, yeah. American, uh, the Family Association. Yeah. We've got Harry Crowcroft, Kareem Masala. Good to see you, Kareem. Uh, thanks for tuning in, folks. And I want everybody watching to know and for your friends to know that you can support the work of the Pro-Life Action League right now. We, uh, like so many organizations, have really struggled during this time of COVID with, um, you know, so many people's economic futures are uncertain, people are out of work, and uh, we're supported 100% by individual donations and, and a few grants along the way. Um, regular folks like the folks watching here, uh, you can make a gift at prolifeaction.org, special 40th anniversary memorial gift at prolifeaction.org. We also have a fundraiser running on Facebook if that's easier for you, but prolifeaction.org would be a great place to go if you want to, um, to help support this work as we go into our, our, 41st, uh, our 41st year. And, you know, continuing all the things that we've been talking about so far. So the League was founded in 1980, uh, June 1st, 1980. Um, how, did, uh, how did the League come to be founded? Because, Jet, you were... People sometimes think that because the league started in 1980, Joe Scheidler started in 1980, but we were just talking uh -huh. about the 70s. You've been involved yeah. since yeah. early on, from the very beginning. Uh, what happened? What happened next after um, after your boss <laughs> pulled you aside and said, "Joe, you really need to go into this business because <laughs> you're not doing advertising." It's a nice anymore. way of saying you're not uh, going to yeah, stay with not, us any longer. You're not staying with us. <laughs> well, that's what that's when I I didn't know exactly. I knew I had to do pro life work but I didn't know exactly where to start. So I just started calling people that I knew that were already in pro-life. And then I knew you had to go find out where the abortion clinics were and try talking to the people that were thinking of abortion. We just uh, started doing everything. And I found many people, uh, there was already the Illinois Right to Life. And so I started working with them. Well, even before and, that, um, my dad is a lawyer and, um, we talked with him about starting an organization uh, because of Joe's background in as a journalist and in public relations, we thought we could publicize the truth about the baby being a human being. And so um, with my dad's help, uh, we set up a, a nonprofit called the Chicago Office for Pro-Life Publicity. Right. And the, the idea would be to raise funds to place advertising in the newspapers. We were just thinking Chicago at the time. Um, with the information about fetal development, basically, uh, you know, heartbeat at three weeks and the brain waves and the baby's fingernails and finger, fingerprints and things like that. Um, but we discovered that raising funds um, was a whole lot more difficult <laughs> than it seemed. Uh, and that an awful lot of people had virtually no interest in the issue. Um, I think it was the year. And it was hard to get something like that in the paper. It was. Uh, but for raising the funds, initially we used the um, alumni directory from Notre Dame University where Joe had graduated and had taught. And we thought 
these would be Catholic people who would have a basic understanding of the value of life. And we were sorely you know, mistaken on that point. Yeah. Yeah. But then, like you say, um, submitting an ad to the Sun-Times or the Chicago Tribune that, that told anything about fetal development, they were extremely reticent. Remember I found these two, two of the guys on the uh, Sun-Times uh, board that did the advertising. Yeah. Uh, I found out they were Catholics. And so I took them out to lunch and I got them Italian food, you know, spaghetti and all that sort of thing. And then right in the middle of the meal, I pulled out the picture, the colorful picture said, of abortion, saline and the whole thing. And they could hardly eat their meal. And so I said, do you know this? This is what you guys are selling in your newspaper. Because they were advertising they were abortion. They a whole page of abortion yeah. ads. And I said, you've got to do something. You either get rid of the ads or give up something. And uh, so about a week later, uh, they called up. Well, I called them. And they said, we're going to give you a free ad. And you can put it right in with the abortion ads. And so I could use the word baby. And abortion, of course, eight letters and babies four. So I'd have my ad would stand out. And then I started doing the information through that ad. Every week I would change to your baby has fingerprints and heart and so on, some fact about the baby in the womb. And uh, that went on for a couple of years. And, yeah. and, uh, and of course, by then, um, Illinois Right to Life was looking for a part-time director because they didn't have any any um, regular full-time people. It was all volunteer. And uh, Dr. Bart Heffernan, one of the founders, had had a serious heart attack. His doctor told him he needed to s step back and, and um, you know, not be quite so, so busy with his medical practice and his pro-life work. And he contacted Joe and asked him if he'd come on part-time. And within a couple of months, they made that a full-time job. Oh, a couple so, of weeks. Like. <laughs> it might have been with a couple of weeks, yeah. yeah so so one I write to life was the actual first full-time yeah. position in pro-life work. And we were able to use that phone number to get people um, information on where they could go to, um, to get help with the pregnancy. And then uh, another nice thing, I went to a, give a talk, and it was a very snowy night, and hardly anybody came. But the people who were there, there were three women there, and we sat around the table and talked. And the one woman had, uh, her husband had a, an empty office in the, the Manadnock building in downtown Chicago. So we were able to get a free uh, office. Yeah. Uh, Right down in for, the, for a couple in, of in years, the, so. for a couple of years yeah. in the heart of Chicago, so that was good because then you could have press conferences, you could go to things, and clinics downtown, and it made it. We began to be known because I'd get on all these talk shows. That's when they had lots and lots of, of talk shows, and you just call in and say, "Why don't we discuss abortion?" Well, it's the law of the land. I'd say, "Yeah, but let's talk about it. Should it be?" And we would get shows set up and have yeah, a, was a lot of that to know people and st people started to know us as the le leaders in the movement along with uh, Wilkie's and others. So it was, it was to but, advantage. But there was a, a little bit of a conflict with some of the leadership of, right. of Illinois Right to Life because actually um, we had both been, uh, Joe more than myself really, but involved in the civil rights movement um, when I was still in college and Joe had marched with Martin Luther King and the Selma to Montgomery march. And because of that background and, and seeing how the civil rights movement unfolded, and of course the, the um, um, anti-war uh, protests as well uh, from, from the Vietnam era, we felt that taking your message to the streets was important, an important way to reach people. And so we would also have pickets in front of abortion clinics and picket uh, pro-abortion politicians and organizations that were pro-abortion. And we used the, um, the, the photos of the victims of abortion, the babies who were killed in abortion, made some of the board members of Illinois Right to Life very uncomfortable. Yeah, they didn't like the picture. They did not like that at all, and they ultimately um, fired him uh, for being too much of an activist. So, 
um, that that was really the catalyst to founding our own organization. We had a little one in between, uh, Friends for Life, which didn't work out as being terribly friendly, so that didn't last very long. <laughs> that didn't be the same problem. And then we decided, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to start an organization focused on activism, and and we're going to be the leaders. We'll be the board members. Nobody can tell us what to do, and we can do it our way. <laughs> so, I had three board members and me <laughs> and Rosemary Stokes, Rosemary Stokes, who was a, a solid activist and yeah, little Rose South Side Rose. Chicago lady that. Yeah, she was terrific. Um, she, in fact, had had an unplanned pregnancy when she was a student at St. Mary's in Notre Dame, Indiana, and had and placed her baby for adoption and never never married and never had any other children. And so she she was very very committed. She was a to, dynamo. Yeah, yeah. yeah, she was. Yeah, I remember her well. Yeah, Cute little lady. Yeah, uh, so many figures like that. In fact, it might be uh, maybe we should take a minute to. Uh, to look at some of uh, the folks you've met along the way. I've got- Oh my goodness, um, yes. <laughs> uh, hopefully the screen sharing is gonna work through this live stream. Uh, that's Antonin Scalia, isn't it? Is that right? I have, yeah, I think I have to get you back on my screen again because okay. when you change something yeah, have... that that's oh, yeah, what happens Antonin's to me. Clear, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Here's Joe with a different Supreme Court justice. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Very black. <laughs> oh, yes. They, yeah. they were having a reception at the Drake Hotel, I believe it was. The rest yeah. of us were out in front picketing. But Andy Schulberg was behind you there, Joe. Yeah. And, uh, and Joe went on in. And, and what, what did you say to, to the justice? Uh, how can you live with yourself? Yeah, I said, how can you live with yourself? <laughs> it's not on your mind. Notice his, uh, his horns there, right? Yes, yeah, right underneath the. <laughs> but, oh, yeah. uh, I, he didn't want to talk. Oh, over here. <laughs> yeah. Oh, who's this guy? Oh, yeah. Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. What a great guy. He was, what a president. And he invited uh, pro life leaders twice to the White House to have mm -hmm. a roundtable discussion on yeah. oh, man. how to, how to change the law. Yeah. It's easy to talk to when he came in the room. Oh, Cardinal yeah, whatever, George. Whatever. Cardinal, George. Oh, Cardinal George. We miss him. We, we miss we him. We can meet with him anytime. You give him a call and you go right down to his office. He yeah. was just such he a. So for a while. Such I a remember man. meeting with him after Hillary Clinton spoke for Mercy Home, and he was so understanding of uh, our need to protest and upset that, that that had gone down. Yeah. Here's another very topical picture Norma McCorvey. Miss yeah, Girl. showing her her own picture in your book closed. Yeah, you know, stop <laughs> abortion. Yeah. It's hard to yeah. believe that the smile on that face is faked. I, I believe she was really. No, uh, she was. Oh, she yeah. was true pro life. And the picture she's looking at was uh, was from when she was still in the abortion camp. Uh, Tommy Romano, who worked for us at the time, interviewing her at a right. at a now rally. Nellie Gray, Nellie Gray, founder of March for Life. Yeah. Yeah, she is. She was another person you could call any time and talk to. Now, who is this? This is in my bundle of pictures, but I don't know who that is. You Look guys remember? <laughs> Sorry, I, you know, I, I, I do. I can't, I can't think. Uh, is she a politician or a media person? I don't uh, a politician to me, but I don't know. Yes. Maybe, maybe he's on the line. Here's one you'll recognize. Oh yes, Bernard Nathanson. Dr. Bernard Nathanson, one of the architects yeah. of abortion, a convert to the pro-life side. Spoke at one of our providers meeting, you know, right. abortion providers meetings, and and he said, "Whatever you need, anytime you need me, I'll come." Uh, he was uh, Dr. Jack Will. Oh, Mildred Jefferson, Mildred Dr. Jefferson. Mildred Jefferson. Yeah, she was president of National Right to Life, I believe prior to Jack Wilkie being president of National Rights. Right. right. Um, the first African-American woman to graduate from Harvard's um, uh, medical school. Medical school, yeah. Was powerful. Oh, and what, what a lady she was, always in a neat little hat. And, uh, yeah. yeah. We miss her. She would yeah. yeah. the kind of leadership we need right now. Yeah, we do. We yeah. do. And then here's a, a group of ne'er-do-wells at a oh. table. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I worked so, yeah. Andy and... Maybe a few other folks. Let me uh, get yeah. back to uh, 
Get back to the screen here. Yeah. They wouldn't let me show that no, picture sir. in my book. No. <laughs> well, <laughs> those are some real. There's a couple of people who went too yeah. far. They went a little too far. Yeah. I was always against violence. I have a chapter in my book on it. But some people went over the line a little bit. You know, Eric, another um, gentleman that we had the honor to meet was Dr. Jerome Lejeune, who is world renowned. Uh, okay medical and, and scientist. He discovered the gene that is, is uh, the cause of Down syndrome. And he, he hoped it would help people to be able to treat the children, people with, with that um, condition more effectively. But we had gone to Paris for our 25th anniversary and contacted um, Dr. Lejeune to see if we could come and, and um, meet him while we were there. And he, he invited us for dinner. So we had dinner in his home with, with he and his wife and just an absolutely delightful evening. And while we were there for dinner, he got a call from the United States about testimony in a case where um, they had uh, um, like frozen embryo, I guess it was a frozen embryo type of, of a situation. And he was there, there was a fight between the, parents of, of the frozen embryos in court. And he was called in to testify about the humanity of the child. So we're listening to him on the phone, you know, giving his, what he's gonna say in court about the, the, uh, the humanity of the unborn child. And it was just fascinating to Well, the whole evening was him. fascinating. Oh yeah. There had been a sword fight in farewell of their apartment. Yeah. Yeah, he, so li he lives on the yeah. lived on the uh, um, island, the Ile de la Cité, where Notre Dame Cathedral. Oh wow! Is uh, is there? Is, I don't suppose there's a picture of any of that. Do you have a photo of that? We do have, well, a yeah, we have a picture of us. Of us, of us um, with him. Yeah. Speaking of photos, uh, one got... of our viewers um, by the name of uh, Peter Kelly has identified the guy we couldn't recognize. That was Gary Bauer. Focus on the family. Gary Bauer. Oh, Gary Bauer. Right. Yes, Bauer. yes. Thank you. Thank you. So far. Thanks, Thanks Peter, for, <laughs> for uh, recognizing him. We feel bad for not. For not we should that. have other um, with with with, with uh, Cardinal O'Connor. We have pictures with Cardinal O'Connor because right. Joe went to a couple of meetings and the Pope. Yeah, Pope, Joe went sorry. to a couple of meetings of pro-life leaders in New York with Cardinal O'Connor, who was a staunch supporter. He was great. And. Um, and John Paul too, of course. Yes. John Paul too. A couple times we talked. Yeah. He was he was a hundred percent. Would have guessed. Life. You wouldn't have ever guessed in 1973 when you were beginning to to work in the pro life field that this would lead to your meeting presidents and popes and bishops and world renowned oh, scientists. And one of the one of the really outstanding stories is Mother Teresa. Mm -hmm. Mother Teresa was speaking at Illinois, uh, no, uh, National Right to Life Convention. And um, she was, Joe was also there with his books, but because his book had some things in it that um, some, pictures. Some, pe some people thought were, well, like Operation Rescue, you were recommending perhaps some civil disobedience and things like that. National Right to Life would, would not allow him to sell his book. So he had the box of books there, not being able to do anything with it. And, um, when Mother Teresa came out to, to give her address, she was a very tiny little lady and she could barely be seen above the podium. So what was, what was your solution, Joe? I just went up and I said, sister, would you move back about a foot? And she did and I pushed my box right behind right the bottom of the podium and she stood up on it. Stood on the box of And the you could see her and the whole audience went wild because there she was, her face and neck and everything. And uh, it, was, it was just a cute thing because I couldn't sell my book anyway. But then I tell people now that she's a saint, we have a second class relic, all those books. <laughs> she had her feet on them. Somebody <laughs> eventually got those books, and lo and behold, they're. Somebody, they didn't know it, yeah, doesn't, doesn't know that they've got a they relic got in a their relic hand. Of them. <laughs> yeah. she was in, in just a minute, I'd like to go through a couple more pictures. Um, and I apologize for not having a kind of a fancy. Uh, you know, uh, uh, PowerPoint for you or anything here. We're just kind of feeling our way forward with Zoom like everybody else these days. And 
Uh, but first, I want to uh, let people viewing know that you can ask questions of, of Ann and Joe and their experience in the pro-life movement, anything at all, you know, whether it's uh, different aspects of the abortion issue or, or fighting abortion or just what it's like to, to be in this kind of a, a milieu for so many years. And also a reminder that folks can make a gift to the Pro-Life Action League in support of our 41st year as we mark our 40th anniversary today at prolifeaction.org. So the, uh, the league was founded in 1980 and in just a few years got embroiled in one of, if not the most um, notorious cases in the history of the United States federal judiciary, uh, Now versus Scheidler, National Organization for Women versus Scheidler. Uh, how did you first hear about the filing of this lawsuit? It's 1986, wasn't it? Right, I was out in Kansas at uh, doing some talks and I, uh, somebody came up and handed me this notice and I was getting all kind of uh, charges right and left and I didn't pay much attention to them. So I looked at it and it was a, now it was suing me for violating the Cler Sher Sherman Clayton antitrust laws. Oh yeah, yeah that's what it was it, initially. Was so, yeah. uh, that uh, somehow I was making money the wrong way. I wouldn't make any money at all. But anyway, I, I just put it in my pocket and uh, came back and then I found out I had to get a lawyer because I had had to face this charge. So um, I didn't know any lawyers that handled cases like that. So uh, we looked around and uh, somebody came up with, who was it came up with uh, Tom Breck? Well, it was my brother-in-law. That's right, I went the to Americans the Americans United for Life, uh, several different you know, nonprofit law firms were, were campaigning to take the case on. I think they, they all thought it would probably be a good fundraising vehicle. Yeah. Um, so Americans United for Life that was based in Chicago did offer to defend us, but they didn't actually know anything about uh, antitrust law. So I asked my brother-in-law, Ken, who's an attorney, if he did antitrust law. And he said, no, he didn't, but he did have a good friend who had just had a case, antitrust case before the Supreme Court. And he introduced us to Tom Brecca. Uh, who was then working for a private law firm um, here in, in the city? Uh, well, later it was later it was later um, yeah. Robinson and Fox. It was Crowley yeah. and Sears or something oh, that he right. was with initially. That law firm split up, and he went with Abramson and Fox. And as the case unfolded and became more complicated, and and actually Patricia Ireland, who was um, uh, wasn't yet the president of the National Organization for Women, recognized that the antitrust thing wasn't going to hold up, which it didn't. The court dismissed mm -hmm. that that aspect of it, but she decided they would add RICO charges, racketeer influence and corrupt organization charges, because that law is made to go after the, the kingpin of an organization that um, she thought she could pin that on, on Joe for running a, uh, an operation that um, cost them would, money. Co would cost that would cost them money and you know caused a lot of protests and things and well, people are by <laughs> how on earth do you take a law meant to go after mafioso mafiosi i don't know how the plural of that but <laughs> how do you take a law that's meant to go after mob bosses you know the guys who are the kingpins who who call the shots but don't do any of the crimes how, yeah how do you take that that kind of a law and apply it to social justice protesting. Well, yeah, we, it's not easy. Clear. We, we, we went to the Supreme Court to, to try to prove that that couldn't be used and we yeah. lost. But you know, the, the, the law requires that there is some kind of an enterprise that is used to, to uh, pull the strings and get everybody to do what it is you want them to do. So the enterprise was in fact a, um, a thing we call the Pro-Life Action Network, which wasn't an incorporated organization of any kind. It was a coalition of pro-life activist groups around the country. And they had meetings every year in one city or another. Some, some member of the group would volunteer to host um, so we had it here in Chicago once or twice, and it was in Wichita and Atlanta, and um, the very first one was Appleton, Wisconsin. And at that particular one, 
Jerry Horn, who he and his, um, he was a, a, a minister at the time, uh, evangelical minister. He and his um, senior pastor owned a hotel in Appleton and they used it as a halfway house for um, dr drug rehab centers and for, for people who were um, just trying to get back on their feet, you know, rather than go to jail, the police would bring them over to their hotel. And, and Jerry is a fabulous cook. And so they hosted the very first of the, of the plan meetings, Polyfaction Action Network meetings. And he put up a big sign to welcome everybody there to the meeting that said, pro-life activists have a blast. Well, when we went, when, when we went to trial, it turned out there was a um, video um, crew that had come to that meeting, uh, supposedly doing a documentary on the pro-life movement in, in America, but they were actually sort of an underground for the now folks. And they filmed quite a bit of, of what went on at that meeting, including that sign, which was posted in our trial uh, on a great big screen to prove that we were actually out to bomb clinics because it said, have a blast on the sign. Jerry's idea was pro-life action, have a ball. But he didn't have enough he, L's he have to finish the L's, sign. So that's what, that's what, he, said. that's what he testified in court. Um, <laughs> I, think I, have, I think I have that picture, if I can, if I can. Uh, you have that picture? If I can yeah. find it here. So oh, a lot, of, a lot of the pro-life, um, stalwarts are in that picture. John Kavanaugh O'Keefe is there, Monica Miller when she was just a kid, practically. Um, I think Lynn Mills is in that picture. Uh, Earl Appleby. I've got it, just give me a second and I'll yeah. find it. Here it is. Um, Probably, have, if he puts pictures up, I'm gonna get stuck. Again, so. <laughs> Hey, hang in, hang, hang in there, folks. I'm. Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna love, around that. You'll love that picture anyway when he gets it up on there. Okay, give me just a second. I'm gonna share my screen and see if this works. I've got it here somewhere. Well, he's got it. I think it's just getting this the right screen. Yep. Here we go. Um, I gotta scroll past our other pictures that we looked at. Sorry if anybody's getting vertigo from all this scanning. There's a picture of Monica. Oh, there's Monica. Oh, here, oh. <laughs> there it is. Whoop. Well, here, let's pause for a second here. There's Pope John Paul II. There's the Pope. Yeah, yeah. Saint Pope John Paul II. Yeah, our second saint. And here's <laughs> our... There it is. Yep. Have a blast. And that was yep. supposed to be dog whistle. We didn't use that phrase back then, but that was supposed to be dog whistle for blowing up abortion clinics. Um, there's Joe right here holding up that sign, saving babies is no crime. And um, John Jakubczyk is the guy on the edge there. Oh, he's, yeah. He's, with the, he's yeah. our attorney. Yeah. Our Midwest or our Western attorney. Our Western attorney. Yeah. yeah. Let's look at a couple more of these photos. Here's Jack Ames. Jack Ames in Jack Baltimore, Ames. Maryland. Yeah, we were talking about Jack just the other day. That Great activist. You guys had to go and. Randy Terry, founder of Operation Rescue. They were making a joke out of the RICO case. That's why the violin case. And <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> there's Monica. Monica. Good friend Monica Miller. Monica Millerino at the time. Oh, there's Monica also. Yeah. Planned Parenthood, the killing place. Was that in um, Gary? Oh, gee, I don't know. I, I think it might have been. Many, we, we, we were protesting out in front of. Um, I think it was a truth tour actually uh, site. The, the first or second year we did truth tours at that that um, Planned Parenthood in Gary, Indiana. And there was, it, it had been very, very rainy and there was this oh, real so slick moss on the sidewalk. And when Monica arrived, she fell on that. Oh no. And just got all, all messed up. And then when uh, a little bit later, when we were ready to leave that site and the truck was gonna pull up next to the sign, Joe went over to pick up a beer bottle out of the, out of the, uh, the gutter so that the truck wouldn't, wouldn't drive over it. And he fell oh, did I on that moss and hit the back of his head and split it open. And then a nurse who happened to be with us rushed over to help and she fell 
So <laughs> he and Joe what went together in the ambulance to the, the hospital, and, and he had to get stitches. And I wouldn't stables. go to a hospital with good portions. <laughs> so they drove all over the place trying to find a family uh, Yeah. Some, some, well, some events. Be thankful. Yeah. Be thankful you were able to go and get stitches. Uh, yeah, I really. I cut my finger horribly the other day and, and would normally have gotten stitches for it for sure. But yeah. there was Not no anymore. COVID. There was no but way. You can't go to, yeah, you can't go to an emergency room. Get it. More than worth it. I'm mm. hoping for the best. Yeah. Yeah, it's a mess. <laughs> I promised people we would look at some baby pictures uh, or some childhood pictures. So we're going to do that in just just a second. Um, I want to remind people, if you've got any questions for Ann or Joe, feel free to ask those about the early days of the movement, about the later days, about where things are now, where they're headed. Um, but let's take a look at... Um, you know, while some, you're getting those up, I, I would mention that... Early on, you know, our fir the first person we ever heard speak on abortion was was Henry Hyde, who was at that time still uh, in the in the state legislature in Illinois, and went on to be um, a congressman from Illinois that, that supported um, the pro life cause all his life. But he he testified in the trial um, in the Navi Scheidler trial, which was a seven week trial in federal court here, and the. Um, the pro boards made sure that the jury couldn't know that he was in fact a congressman, although they knew it, knew it anyway. They had to call him Mr. Hyde, but um, the lawyer for the other side, um, Lowell Sacknoff was one of the lawyers, actually Faye Clayton's husband, Faye who represented now. He kept trying to get um, Henry Hyde to say that he didn't like protests and you know didn't believe in in anything where somebody might break the law or anything like that, and Henry Hyde was just brilliant. Sure. And in response to that, um, you don't like protests thing, um, he said, "If more people had behaved like Joe Scheidler had, we might not have had so many people die in places like Auschwitz." And the, uh, the, the lawyer jumped up and yelled, you know, objection, objection. And the judge pounded his gavel. And oh, my goodness, it was just mayhem. But brilliant, just brilliant. Oh, yeah, he was good. He's one of the lions. We miss him. Yeah. So can you see this photo here? Who do we have in this picture? <laughs> Mary Louise and Evelyn Ann, my two older sisters. And yeah, so Mary Louise is on the left. Left one. And Evelyn, and, Evelyn yeah. on the right, and there's baby Joe. Baby Joe. Right in the yeah, middle. Their big brother. <laughs> Little <baby>. brother. <laughs> they did it. Or again, is that with a friend or is that with one of your sisters? That's Ellie, my it's youngest. Ellie. We're going to see her tonight. Yeah, sadly, um, her husband, Bob. Yeah, her husband way, just died. Yeah. We were going to miss him. He was such a gracious man and oh. um, very difficult to have a funeral at this time. Now, I think no one else watching is going to get this reference, but I think the little boy on the horse looks so much like young William Castleman, your grandson. Uh -huh. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> that was Tony Jr. Rex. My yeah, horse. he named his horse. Tony yeah. Jr. Rex. <laughs> that is the greatest little bicycle, isn't it? A horse bicycle. A horse bicycle. Yeah. Kind of reminds you of that little carriage, baby carriage in Gone with the Wind, where <laughs> Rhett and uh, Scarlet are pushing Bonnie Blue down the street, and they've got a, a little bobbing pony thing on the front of the baby carriage. I love that horse. <laughs> Here's, it looks like a brother has been uh, indoctrinated into a uh, girl's a tea, tea party. party. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I still do tea parties every year, and so oh, yeah. once in a while he comes to be the butler or something. Now, <laughs> <laughs> now are these the boys? The boys. Yeah. Joe and Bob and Jim. Yeah, yeah, Jim's the baby there, youngest Bob's brother. Bob's the middle guy, and he was um, killed a couple of years ago. Yeah. Well, actually, it's about 19 years now. Yeah. Got hit by a van. I think there's a picture of my baby brother, Matthias, that looks just like you in that photo, Dad. When really? He was about maybe 12. Yeah. Uh -huh. Bomber jacket in Hartford, Indiana. Yeah. That's our house. The old homestead. And then fast forward to... Teenager. Yep. Yep. Father Leo and Bob. That oh, that's right. Father Leo. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Father Leo, who Father introduced Leo. us to pro life ministry, really. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe all geared up. World War II. 
Look like Jim there. As I got in it. What? Dabra? Being, deb being debonair. Debonair. <laughs> These are a couple yeah. of students. So there's some girls from, uh, young women from St. Mary's, Notre Dame. July 1947, what that right. says. And then here are you with your uh, seminary class. Right. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's a scola. How about that? How about that? These people are sometimes scandal. And then this is the famous, uh, the famous photo. I remember this one. That was when he was taught at Mundelein College. That's how he looked when I met him. <laughs> 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 Met him and married him. <laughs> How about it? Wow, that's fun to look back at those old photos. My yeah. yeah, it is. It is. How many years? Yeah. I keep hearing these ads on the radio for some company that will take all your old pictures and put them in digital format to save them for you. <laughs> we got to do that with all those. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, John had John suggests that we we should mention you know going back to the history a little bit that we have long since forgiven Illinois right to life and we all get along great now. Oh yeah. Um, oh yeah. Great friends with Illinois. I never right to made life. enemies with any of the. No. Groups. No. I don't, bad to have enemies. Um, John is big on forgive and forget. <laughs> yeah, is, it's easier. It's hard to remember. <laughs> Keep a yeah, grudge. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot of work. And Illinois right to life does a lot of great work. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. With Mary Kate Nora. That's. Um, that's their director now, and that's Rosemary great. Hackett, that's uh, the, the chairman oh, yeah. of the board. Great. We got Mary a comment Kate. from a Mary Adams. Um, she says she went to uh, Chicago for one of the plan activities uh, in the early 90s from Omaha with uh, Larry oh. Donlin's uh, Rescue the Heartland group. And oh. they went around to different abortion clinics, did a Jericho march, and right. then yeah. she sat with Normal Corvey. Um, you know, I, preferably uh, outside of an abortion uh, facility in Chicago with the police guarding uh, Planned Parenthood, is, in fact, is what it was. Um, so we're getting some uh, some little history from some of our viewers. Yeah, great. Uh, Patrick great. Virtue Thanks. says, congratulations on 40 years. Uh, you and Archbishop O'Connor, dad, were his inspiration to start a pregnancy center in 1989. How about wow. that? Right. You know, we got a call the other day, uh, Friday actually, from Bob Newman in in um, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, yeah. uh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, yeah, who just called to say, I think he had seen one of the other Zoom conversations, as a matter of fact, and he called up to say, thank you for changing my life. Yeah. He went to hear a talk when Joe was out in Pittsburgh um, years, years ago, um, and Bob got real involved and uh, ended up leading face the truth tours and oh, he was very um, active uh, he just called to say thank you for changing my life that. yeah yeah i get to hear that story a lot you know traveling around and, and meeting with people uh you know your dad gave a talk such and such and i've been doing this ever since it's always really yeah. inspiring no, i've been that. poor ever <laughs> <laughs> now many of the people who have seen you at talks around the country and around the world will have uh, recognized your your um, ubiquitous fedora, the black hat, and oh, Steve yeah. Perutka, who's one of our good friends, wants to know the origin of the black hat. How did you come to be known for wearing oh, the black hat? Yeah, I it was at my my father's funeral was in December, and it was freezing. Nineteen seventy four. And Dad had died of a heart attack, and he always wore a hat and. A, and Joe never foot. did. I mean, I would always I say, don't you think you should put on a hat? It's freezing out. No, no nobody would. No, I never wear a hat, he'd say. But I was cold, and there was Dad's hat and coat because he'd been ready for a trip when he had a heart attack. And the coat and hat were on the bottom of the bed. So I just picked them up, and the coat felt so good. And I put the hat on, and it was a perfect fit. We both had the same size head. Yeah. So I wore it to the funeral. And somebody said, that you look sort of like your dad. And I thought, well, he's a lot better looking than I was, so I'm going to keep his hat. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't taken it off ever since. I've got dozens well, I've bought of bought a few of them since then. Yeah. yeah. I have a whole yeah. case of hats. But that was, the, that was the reason I started wearing a hat, because I, that was a time when hats had gone out of style. Yeah. You used to see everybody had a hat back in Dad's day. But then that well, went the fedora has not exactly made a comeback. <laughs> no, it hasn't made a comeback. You see more people, but not as many. Bob Pawson is asking if we have any photos of your white suit. I don't have any ready to hand, but that was a. Oh, a we do have one. them. Yeah, that used to be the thing. 
Bob Thank says he could only find you from a mile away at the March for Life because of that because of the white suit. I wore the white suit in summer and the black suit in the winter. Yeah. Now you've actually auctioned off the hat any number of times. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Somebody too. came up with that idea at a fundraiser, um, pregnancy center fundraiser, I think, and, and a few people have done it since. So whatever yeah. hat he happened to wear to that event gets. Now they typically would yeah. donate it back to you, wouldn't they? So you wouldn't go home on hat. No, I don't think no, so. I, I never got it. <laughs> I went home bareheaded, <laughs> freezing to I death. Keep buying more hats. <laughs> yeah, I have a few times. It's a cute yeah. idea. Well, we've just about uh, actually we've gone a little over an hour, which is which we is have, great. and we didn't even get to the end of the Navi Scheidler. Oh well, it never ends. Really. Well, it ultimately <laughs> went to the Supreme Court, and we ultimately won. And oh yes, no, spoilers! <laughs> <laughs> I was going to tell people the only way they could find out is to buy the book. Where is the book? Oh, well, there's that too. I'm sure. Well, if you want to know how we found, how we ended up winning, I think my, I think Matt stole my book. He's going to bring it back to me so I can show, oh. show that to people. Thank you. Yeah, the story's in there. Racketeer for Life, a memoir, fighting the culture of death, from the sidewalk to the Supreme Court, three times. Yeah. That That's was right. monumental to go through 40 years of history to dig up all of those, those details. Yeah, right. of, uh, my son uh, Peter helped a great deal putting that book together. That's why wow. I got by Joe Scheidler and Peter Scheidler. Yeah, it wouldn't have happened without Peter's um, Thanks to Peter's Peter's assistance. Peter's. Yeah. Yep. I'm going to finally be seeing him again tomorrow after uh, months of uh, the brothers and I got together. Those who don't know, there are four Scheidler brothers. We got together uh, one day. Um, well, actually, Joe wasn't there, unfortunately. Um, my next younger brother, but uh, Pete and Matt came out, and we hung out with my sons and had a real fun fun day when you guys were having the tea party that you mentioned before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then uh, lockdown came a couple weeks after that, so it's been a while. So it's been a while, yeah. I'm grateful for Pete's efforts on putting uh, racket. Oh, Pete, Pete's the dad of the two kids that we celebrated graduations yeah. for yesterday, too. Mother if anybody wants to, uh, to get a copy of this, if you don't have a copy of Racketeer for Life, if you go to prolifeaction.org and go to our store, um, you can get a copy, signed copy. I have my copy signed uh, by Joe, my dad. He loves to sign those books, so. Oh, yeah, I just did two of them before <laughs> we came in here. We recently heard about a woman who, uh, one of our, our donors who, um, had a copy of the book, just dog-eared, and she'd been sending it around to everybody. She said, oh, I wish I had a signed copy. So we sent her one, and uh, I told her, donate the other one to the library. She said, I can't. I've got all my notes in it. So I'm just going to share that with my friends, and then I'll keep this copy. So she's, she's got a copy that's circulating around with all of her notes in it. And she's <laughs> got her signed copy now, too, up on the shelf. That's nice to hear. Well, we it's a good thank book. Everybody. I, I enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, these conversations are great. People have really loved them, and, and it's been fun for me to, to catch up because I don't always know all the history. I, I like I said earlier, I did not realize that those Christmas ornaments were from uh, Mary Jane, or how, what, how did I say her name? O.J. Nini. O.J. Nini. O.J. Nini. How cute. I think she actually signed the Christmas. I think the, her, she put O.J. on the bottom of the ornaments. Oh, wow. I'd love to notice that next Christmas. How about that? How about that? Yeah. Yeah, so even I'm learning some stuff along the way. Wow. Some wonderful people in this movement. There are. We've had such a privilege yes. to meet these wonderful people, and some of them are listening now, you know, Brian Gibson and Steve. Oh, good, Brian. He's probably eating a croissant. Yes, when Joe is always <laughs> called Brian Gibson, the Clark Gable of the pro-life movement. Yeah. Young people won't even know who he is, but Clark yeah, Gable. Who's Clark Gable? Super handsome yeah. <laughs> actor. Right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> there. Yeah. Well, the Pro-Life Action League is now uh, 40 years old, or we've begun our 41st year. Uh, I've been with the league since uh, late 2002, uh, aside from a couple stints part-time doing some stuff and volunteering and coming out for protests as a kid and all of that. But I think you designed uh, one of our very first um, Pro-Life Action League brochures when you were still in or just out of college. Um, yeah, I think I was still in college at the time. I think yeah. it was uh, a brochure about, uh, was it about uh, going out to the abortion clinics or was it something else? I, I think it was just about what the Pro-Life Action League does and a, yeah. a lot of stuff on it. Yeah. 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 
well, yeah, it was my first foray into layout and design, which I do a lot of now. It's funny the things you do in pro-life. Yeah. Well, and Joe taught layout and design in a college class at, at Mundelein College. So, you know, you, you bring all of your various skills to the pro-life movement. Whatever it is you know how to do can be useful. <laughs> We've had to learn how to design signage. We've had to learn how to comb through architectural plans and um, yeah. To well, I think we we really excel at the league in the signage area, for you know, getting your message out to the public on the on the yeah, public, our on the public cars, forum. Going out on the street, the pictures, yeah. people have to see them. Yeah, yeah we, you know, when you practice it years enough, you learn, you learn, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. High contrast. A lot of people don't do that. You know, you got to have yeah. black on white, white on black. It's got to be bright. It's got as few words as possible. You're going to form it. Words are easier to read. Yeah. Than Fourteen, and uh, the image. Like when, when the opposition comes out with their construction paper signs made with magic marker and about a hundred words on a page, and yeah. you, you know, your 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 tendency is to say, "Let me teach you how to do yeah. that." Right. <laughs> Let's have a tutorial, guys. But then you're like, "I don't really want to." I teach don't want them to do it right now. <laughs> they won't listen to us anyway. I like it when they come out with the bed sheet that's been painted with. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, we've got a good closing question from, I hope I pronounced her name correctly, Abby Bognarno. Any advice for young adults in the pro-life movement who want to make a difference in our generation? Let's close oh with that, with an answer to that question. Advice for young adults. I, I would say get out there and be outside in the public forum. Don't just sit at a keyboard and, and um, you know, give your thoughts on on facebook or something go out stand in front of an abortion clinic pray in front of those clinics take a sidewalk counseling training program and learn how to reach out and and offer alternatives to the women and join or or organize uh protests against the clinic that opens in your town there are a lot of uh, pro-life young people's groups now that are going up our, our uh granddaughter hope is the president of what is that suit the crusaders crusaders, really, yeah. crusaders are a great group something like that get to be with other people but there's um, a tendency as you move beyond the student level to feel like there's not anywhere to go with your commitment but there is you know we we need people to be out there in front of those abortion clinics that's so critically important because every day girls are going in there and and seeking abortions and so often we've heard from people if only someone had been there the day Somebody. i was there i might not have made this tragic mistake i hear that so much and it makes you feel guilty because you can't we can't be there every day but somebody can and there has to be somebody at every clinic every day that's the saddest <laughs> saddest thing to me is that there are so many babies who are dying abandoned Abandoned yeah. by, obviously, their, their parents, abandoned by the legal system that allows that, abandoned by the society that condones it, but also abandoned by the pro-life movement that wasn't there that day. It wasn't there, yeah. The a child it's, dying unmourned. It's troubling. Yeah. Yeah. And, and it's not easy to do, but yeah. you feel very satisfied <clears throat> when you get out there and, and you do it. You know, you go when you don't feel like it. And uh, something else... Yeah. Monica Miller. Go ahead. I was just going to say Monica Miller wrote a beautiful book, Abandoned. And, uh, yeah, that read. really catches the, it really that, catches um, the spirit of that. Yeah. What the baby, the baby is abandoned by everybody. Wouldn't it be something not to be loved by anyone? In your, in your first book, Closed, 99 Ways to Stop Abortion, uh, Oh, I've, here's that here's that picture of Norma McCorvey with uh, Tommy Romano. Oh, oh Tommy yeah. Romano, yeah. <laughs> um, again and again in this book, and there's a whole chapter dedicated to it, Dad. You talk about the importance of of knowing your stuff, getting informed, um, and that's something else I think we should mention for Abby and for for other young people. Is learn, learn. One of the best tools for that is our handbook. We are working on the sixth edition right now. Copies will be available soon. Sharing the pro-life message. Um, having ready to hand um there's a case that illustrates the importance of that knowledge um it happened just the other day you know as many viewers will know we protested at the new abortion uh, mega center in waukegan illinois that planned parenthood just opened um just about 10 days ago it was on friday may 22nd 
I don't think, uh, Mom and Dad, I don't think you know this. Uh, Nick Wiesner, who was there with us mm -hmm. on the staff that day, uh, his girlfriend broke up with him because he was there. He was dating really? a girl. Oh, my he goodness. He just started dating. They hadn't been dating very long. Mm -hmm. And he knew that she was kind of on the fence about abortion. She knew he was pro-life. And it was something they were talking about. He was finding out she just did not know. It's not a clump of tissues. There's a formed child here very early on when all these different milestones happen. But when, um, when she found out that his views were actually being put into action, she was okay with him being pro-life in his head. But once he did something about it, she, she said, well, this relationship's not going anywhere. So Nick's a young guy and he'll be fine. But uh, taking one for the team, I was really uh, kind of proud of him for sticking up. Yeah, for yeah, that's like tough. That. So that's another piece of uh, advice for Abby, you know, and all other young people. You're going to suffer. People are going to be mad at you. They're, they're going to think you're a reactionary. They're going to think you're a bigot. They're going to think you're a knucklehead. But, you know, be gracious, be kind, and, and know your stuff and share the message all the same. Yeah. You know, there's been the story recently about Abby Johnson and, uh, you know, that she was actually. Oh, you're thinking. You're oh, thinking no, no, you're Norma, thinking Norma McCarvey, <laughs> the uh, Roe, Roe v. Wade. And um, we've had some long discussions on that. That, uh, but she was she was a hundred percent pro life. At the end, no matter what they did, they did put a movie out. Right? Yeah, yeah. That's, exactly. yeah I mean, that's one of the that's one of the horrible things about it. You're a target in that way. What a horrible thing to have your memories of somebody so played with and twisted and distorted. And, and now, you know, in a lot of people's minds, there's a question mark. It's just uh, another mark of the battle that we're in. Yeah, yeah, the battle is gonna go on for a long time. Even if we do see the Supreme Court overturn oh, yeah. Roe v. Wade, and, and I, I think it will happen, but it won't end abortion and it won't end the battle and the discussions and the need for people to be involved and to right. keep, keep uh, moving forward. Because until we protect every life, um, our work is not finished. And I do think that the, the callous disregard for life in our country, our city, particularly here in Chicago, we have every weekend um, several people killed in, in violence. And I think it, I do think it all uh, reflects the, the Roe v. Wade uh, decision that life has no value. Yeah. And if it doesn't have any value at the beginning, where, where exactly does it get its value? So when yeah. if, if we are able ever to restore that sense of the dignity and sanctity of life, we will see violence decrease in every area right. of the culture. Yeah, you know, once, once we start to see some lives is not mattering, unborn lives, black lives, right. immigrants lives, anybody's lives, you know, all mm -hmm. life has value. All life is all life has value. a reflection of God's image and we need to embrace it, yeah. and cherish it, cherish it. We do. Well, yeah. a good place to land might be to, to kind of emphasize to everybody watching and those who are going to be watching later when we share the, the recording that uh, the fact that the Pro-Life Action League has been there for 40 years, I think says a lot about the longevity of this movement. There were a handful of pro-life organizations in 1980, and now it's hard to count them. I know. And we thought it would only take a couple of years to bring sense to the American people because we thought everybody at heart valued life. It's a lot more deep-seated difficulties here than we... Uh, realized in our naivete in 1973. <laughs> yeah. It's proved a longer battle than we expected, but we're it still did. here. We're still alive. We're still fighting. We're still working. We're still converting. And we're going to keep doing it as the years go forward. Yeah. Yeah, as long we as are. I've got breath. Yeah. <laughs> to use that to well, you're the second stuff. generation, and I'm sure the third generation. <laughs> well, <laughs> my, my niece, Hope, is working with the Crusaders, so generation yeah. after yeah. generation. Well, and every one of your kids has participated in our on our crew in the Summertime right. Truth Tours. Right. Do a fabulous job at it. And, and they can all discuss the issue, whether you do it publicly or you do it privately with a friend in a conversation, yeah. or at school, at work. Hope is so enthusiastic that I have to kind of rein her in a little bit. Hope, I know you're having a great yeah. chat with that guy. It's time to load the sides <laughs> in the truck. She's great. Yeah, so. she loves debate. She loves the debate, yeah. So the pro life movement is alive and well. The pro life action yes. is alive and well. Anna and Joe Scheidler are alive and well, and so are we all are. of our friends and supporters. 
Thank you to everyone for joining us for this chat. Uh, Mom and Dad, thanks so much for joining me and letting me ask you some questions about the pro-life movement and the organization. Oh, thanks for leading the discussion. All right. Thanks for Steve Peruka. <laughs> thanks, Steve Peruka, for coming and talking about like that. What a great year. So we will uh, we'll be coming back to you guys again soon. Uh, we've really enjoyed these chats. We're going to keep doing this kind of thing. People really enjoy it. Thanks to everybody for, for tuning in. And, uh, you know, just to know that the Pro-Life Action League is here for you. I'm here for you. Uh, my colleagues, uh, John and, and Matt, are here. Our, uh, our investigator, Gene, is there hunting down the, the malfeasance of the abortion industry. And Ann and Joe oh, are there giving us uh, all of the deep institutional knowledge and experience and, um, you, you know, just toughness that they have over the years and, and giving this organization its sort of roots and, and heart. So thank you for that, uh, folks. You're welcome. Thank you, Eric. All right, being our leader. Bye, everybody. We'll see you. Uh, Bye -bye. We'll see you again real soon. Hope everybody okay. stays safe and, uh, and that everything kind of calms down and we can get back to a little bit of normal life, which for us means continuing to speak out for our unborn brothers and sisters. God bless you. God bless. God bless. <laughs>